Hello, my name's Robert Dean Steele, and today this is our prayer time, and we're looking forward to spending some time with you today. So, Father, thank you again for this prayer time, and also, Lord, every time we get together, we learn something new from God's Word, a new perspective, and so we want to give you praise and thanks in Jesus' name, amen. Well, Father, I thank you today for that wonderful scripture contained in Proverbs, which it says, he who wins souls is wise. Now, Father, that should be the object of every one of our discussions. Now, Lord, I know that we live in a world of change, and we know that, Lord, there are many religions in the world, but we recognize that it was Jesus who said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus also illustrated in the Sermon on the Mount that there were two paths that were leading to eternal life. One, of course, led away from God, and the other one led towards God. Now, Jesus said that there was a highway that led to where basically people find themselves. We call it hell. And it is wide, and it is like a super highway, and there are many people who are traveling it. But Jesus also said there's a path to eternal life. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that path is not, is narrow, and it can be a little bit uh, daunting to get there. But he says, basically this, it will lead to eternal life. Now, Lord, we have some wonderful lessons that we can learn from when it comes to nature. For example, if you want to get the best view, you have to, of course, go through the difficult climbs. I remember when I was a lad, one of my friends whose name was Roger Anderson, Roger said to us, uh, let's go up to Goat Lake. I said, where is Goat Lake? He says, well, what we need to do is we need to drive up the Red Rock Canyon Road. So we did that. And then the at the end of the Red Rock Canyon Road, there happens to be a path. Now, the path leads into the mountains. And one of those climbs or one of those paths leads up to Goat Lake. Now, it's about a seven kilometer or about a five, four and a half mile walk up the side of the mountain. And so we began to walk up the side of the mountain and, and you know, and we were walking along this three foot cliff or uh, three foot path along the cliff for several spaces. Uh, and I remember looking down thinking, I said, Roger, are you sure you know where you're going? <laughs> and he says, well, all we have to do is follow the path. Well, we went up the side of the mountain. It took us about three and a half hours. And uh, we got up to the top of the path and there was a beautiful waterfall that was coming down from the side of the uh, side of the mountain. And he said, just about half a mile up on the top, you'll find Goat Lake. And so we continued to climb and we got up to the top there and at the top of the mountain. And Lord, whenever you do something, it is absolutely beautiful. Was this beautiful mountain clear lake? I, I can still see it, even though I was it was many, many decades ago that we made that trip. And I remember looking at it and saying, This is absolutely beautiful. It was a lake that was completely surrounded, at least on three sides sides by the side of a mountain. It was gorgeous, and it was cold, and it was very refreshing. I remember Roger and I sitting down on the side of the lake on some rocks and dangling our feet on that cold, that warm summer day in that cold lake after going up those uh, that path. And also, when we went down, we kind of just enjoyed the beauty of the Rocky Mountains as we head down. Now, it wasn't an easy climb. In fact, it was a difficult climb. And there were times where, you know, it got a little bit dicey. But I remember it specifically about the fact that, Lord, how beautiful 
the Rocky Mountains were, and I kept on walking down there and saying, this is beautiful. Now, of course, later on, I came to know you and to realize that actually you are just showing off. When we get to those beautiful spots, Lord, I remember this one particular time, Lord, as well, again, doing some uh, climbing in the Rocky Mountains in Waterton, which happened to be at the time my favorite place to go. And I remember I was walk, I was climbing the side of a mountain at the time. And I, I looked back and I thought, my goodness, this is absolutely beautiful. And I remember taking a couple of moments, just sitting on the ledge of a, of a mountain and looking over the beautiful Rocky Mountains and thinking to myself, Lord, this is absolutely wonderful. And then I've said to myself, what am I doing up here? Because <laughs> I was a father of two wonderful children and my wife was down below. And that's when I made the decision that I need to get down off the mountain. But Father, I thank you today for that wonderful opportunity to be able, Lord, to understand that when we go to prayer, and now this is the application that I want to bring with this whole situation, Lord, and that is that when we decide to pray, and especially pray for souls. It's not an easy task because, Lord, we are fighting the enemy, we are fighting the world, and we are fighting our own flesh and our own desires. Lord, each soul, and I, I saw a video today of a lady who was reminding pastors about the importance of fighting for souls. The greatest message or the greatest thing that we can do is actually fight for souls in prayer. And that's why I love to pray. And that's why I love to spend time on YouTube and all my different channels and, and um, media platforms teaching you how to pray and to teach you about the priority of prayer because prayer is the highest and also the most holy calling of all. You say, why would you say that? The reason I say that, Lord, is because of the fact that that's what our Lord Jesus Christ is doing right now. He is praying for us. And it was very interesting that, Lord, in John chapter 17, Jesus, as his final act, he prayed. He prayed for his disciples. He prayed for the Christian church, and he prayed for himself. Now, Father, if Jesus saw that that was a priority in the last moments of his life, then it is absolutely essential for us today. We need to be people who in every moment of our lives be cognizantly aware that, Lord, you have a plan for our lives. That's why Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he said, pray without ceasing. We know that praying without ceasing is having an attitude of prayer constantly. We may not be always mouthing the words, but Lord, there's something that I discovered not that long ago, and I was having some insomnia at the time I was not able to sleep, and I was trying different means and methods, and then finally, I said, you know what? I'm going to pray in my mind. Now, I do believe in, of course, and I do subscribe the power of prayer with the spoken word. But from time to time, I have discovered that if I just concentrate on sending mental thoughts to God, because you have to understand, God knows all and sees all. And so an aspect of, of our prayer life can be actually sending mental prayers to the Lord. I didn't realize how powerful it was until I began to send mental thoughts to the Lord. Now, it was interesting interesting that that night I began to pray in my mind. And immediately everything settled down. All of a sudden, I was beginning to relax. And that is the most important thing about getting ready to go to sleep, is relaxing. And as I began to, you know, reflect on the goodness of God, I would say, Lord, thank you today for your wonderful love. Thank you, Lord, today for your wonderful grace. And I began to thank the Lord, and that once again, I began to relax. Well, it wasn't too long before I was asleep. And now I use that as a technique to go to sleep. 
I begin to think on the good things of God. Now, that's what we were, uh, Paul told us to do in Philippians chapter 4, verses 7, 8. He says, whatsoever things are right and pure and holy and praiseworthy, virtuous, true and lovely. He says, think on these things. Basically, we begin to think on the things of God. And what happens is we begin to be thankful. And that's what Paul said when he said, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God for those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm not just giving you pop psychology. I am giving you today a wonderful opportunity and a wonderful avenue in which you can have success in prayer. Now, of course, as well, Lord, we know that we need to saturate and also as well uh, expound the word of God in our prayer times. We need to remind God about his promises because Paul again wrote in 2 Corinthians, the promises of God are yes and amen. And Lord, help us to realize that today, that they are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. It's through the avenue of Jesus Christ that we have access today. So what are we praying about today? Well, yesterday, of course, we prayed about our family situation. Lord, today, I would like to bring before your throne, Lord, those who do not know you and those that, Lord, have knew you at one time, but, Lord, are not serving you again. Lord, we all have friends who were saved at the same time as we were. Lord, I have many friends who were saved in the revival that I was saved in. And Lord, I'm so grateful for that salvation. But Lord, today, many of them have turned away from you. And some would say, well, were they really saved? Absolutely. They were gloriously and powerfully saved. God used them. And yet today, they are back in the world. They're, they're like the prodigal. And that's a wonderful story that we can use today, Lord, to recognize that there are all prodigals. Individuals that, Lord, you know, made a decision and sometimes didn't make that decision. You know, it's easy, Lord, to allow the cares and riches of this life to choke out the message of Jesus Christ. But Lord, today, we are praying for those, whatever whatever reason they chose to walk away from the goodness of God. We know this, that Lord, they are now subject to the images and standards of this world. We recognize that Lord, they have fallen into the path of selfish ambition and also as well envy. And we, and also as well, Lord, they are allowing the enemy to rob, kill, and destroy them, to use accusation, temptation, and deception upon the Father today. We know that it tells us in the book of Jeremiah that you are married to the backslider. That means that, Lord, you have never divorced them. You have always wanted them back. But what we need to do, Lord, is we need to pray for them. Because, Lord, we are creatures who makes our own decisions. As Mike Warnke put it this way, if you end up in hell, that's because you paddled your own canoe. Well, Father, today, we want to pray for those individuals. We love them. And we do not want them to go to a lost eternity. It was interesting that, Lord, uh, recently Dr. David Jeremiah talked about a revival that was going to be happening after the rapture. And, of course, that will be a dramatic event. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, all of a sudden, millions, hundreds of millions of people will disappear and that which is mortal will put on immortality, and that which is corruptible will put on incorruption. In that twinkling of an eye, Paul says in Philippians, or 1 Thessalonians 4, he says, we will be changed. And Lord, in that moment, and this is the incredible thing, that's why we need to pray what we need to pray for, Lord, because the simple fact is, we do not know. In fact, Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 24, he says, the Son of Man will come at a time where you're not expecting him. Lord, we know that to be true. And unfortunately, many of us are not ready. I love the philosophy of 
Ruth Graham Lotz. She simply said this. She says, I live my life as if this is the last five minutes on the planet. It certainly brings focus when we do that. Now, Lord, in regards to that, Dr. David, Dr. David Jeremiah said there will be a great revival. Of course, many people will realize what we've been saying for the longest time is absolutely true. What is incredible is that when Noah and his family went into the ark and the water began to fall, people realized <clears throat> in that moment that Noah was right and they were wrong. But it was too late. And Lord, for all of our preaching and all of our teaching, we're trying to get people to, you know, give their lives to Christ. And Lord, we don't have an, an awful lot of time. I was thinking about that little girl who basically said, you know, and she was not going to be covered and is still very vivid in my memory. And of that little girl who said, Mommy, Jesus is coming back. And her mom at the time was trying to console her. She was trying to comfort her and she would not be comforted. And the reason why she wasn't going to be comforted is because Jesus Christ was coming back. And she felt the incredible agony, the urgency, and also the crisis that our world is in right now. As the world progresses towards the end days. Here is the church. We are the first responders. We need to recognize, and I, I love this little Facebook post that goes simply like this, I, my, he my heaven, earth is not my home, heaven is, and I'm just down here recruiting. That's why we need to pray. That's why we need to pray for the backsliders. That's why we need to remind them that Jesus Christ could come back at any time. Dr. David Jeremiah says there's going to be a great revival. There will be. All these backsliders will all of a sudden realize that they were wrong and that we were right. And the problem is it will be too late. They will have to go through the tribulation period. And there will be many who will give their lives to Jesus Christ. So some of them will actually be preachers. They'll be sitting in their churches, and, and I've seen that illustrated, Lord, in different movies about the fact that there are pastors in their churches now preaching to empty pews, recognizing that they had been talking of the wrong thing. They have been giving pop psychology. They have been given motivational speaking, but that's not what we need. We need to have the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, simplistic and powerful. And that's what the apostle Paul did when he went from Athens to Corinth. He made a decision in the city of Corinth that he was going to preach Christ crucified and him only. And Lord, we need to do that as well. We need to keep it very simple. I saw a video today about a, 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 a lady who was talking to pastors and she said, Pastor, people do not need to have psychology. They do not have to have, you know, sermonettes. They need to hear Thus saith the word of the Lord. And when we are praying, <clears throat> that is what we need to do as well. There are two things that I, uh, I, I love about D.L. Moody. Both of them are very powerful. D.L. Moody was in a service with Harold Barley and with other particular ministers in the country of Great Britain. And as he was there, the Spirit of God fell and uh, Harold Barley stood up and said this, the world is yet to see what God can do with a fully consecrated man. That became the uh, philosophy of D.L. Moody. He said, I want to be that fully consecrated man. Years later, when they, the, they were in the city of London and there was all kinds of people that had gathered together, ministers had gathered together, and they said, who should we bring over and one of the ministers said to him, uh, said out loud, we should bring D.L. Moody. Well, one of the pastors there said, what are you talking about? We have some of the finest preachers in the world here in London. Why don't we have them come? Why Moody? And the man said this. He says, well, we all know that we need the power of the Holy Spirit. He says, the one thing I know about D.L. Moody is he isn't just filled with the Holy Spirit. He says, the Holy Spirit has a monopoly 
on his life. I pray today that, Lord, we would recognize that our prayers have to have that component of the monopoly of the Holy Spirit. Paul puts it so beautifully in Romans chapter 8. He says, when we don't know how to pray, then what we do is we ask the Holy Spirit to enable us to do that to the point where we may do it with groanings that cannot be uttered. Either way, Lord, we need to do that. So that's why we're praying today for the backslider. Lord, as well, we are asking today for the unsaved. Father, there in my city of uh, where I serve, in the city of St. Albert, there's 60 plus thousand unsaved people. In the greater Edmonton area, I'm going to say that most likely there's over a million people who do not know the Lord. And Father, that is a tragedy. And that's why we need to pray. Because Lord, we know that Peter says this, that God doesn't want any should perish, but all to come to the everlasting life. And what is so incredible and a little daunting is to realize that God has given us that task. Now, Father, we can't go and convince someone to give their lives to Jesus Christ unless we prayed it through. And that's why we're here today, because, Lord, we are praying it through. We know that Jesus said that we need to pray to the Lord of the harvest, that he would send laborers. Now, we recognize that we are the laborers that God sends. Thank you for that. But, Lord, before we even step one step out into our world, we need to pray. We need to pray that we will have the anointing, the authority, the enablement, we'll have the power, we'll have the wisdom, the clarity, the boldness to be able, Lord, to effectively share the word of God. Giving that uh, word fitly spoken like apples of gold and pitchers of silver. Father, we need divine wisdom, divine insight, and divine discernment to be able, Lord, to effectively bring the gospel. Now, Lord, also the aspect of prayer is that we are praying, let's say, for example, the Lydias. Lord, when the Apostle Paul went and talked to Lydia by the river, the Bible says that the Lord opened her heart and mind to receive what Paul had to say. How did that happen? Paul and those that were part of his party prayed. They spent time in prayer preparing, Lord, the ground. I, I remember the story of Daniel Nash and how that Daniel Nash would go into a community and spend day after day in prayer, fighting through until he knew he had the victory, until he knew that the forces of hell had been routed. He knew that the forces of the world had been dominated by the Spirit of God. He knew that hearts would be open. And then he would say, he would send a telegram to Mr. Uh, Charles Finney and say, come to the community. Lord, it is the prayer work that is done beforehand that is going to bring success when, when it comes to our evangelism. That's why we spend so much time in prayer. That's why we ask for the backslider. That's why we ask, Lord, for the unsaved loved ones. That's why we ask, Lord, for those that, Lord, have never heard the gospel. It says in Romans chapter 10, it says, how can they hear unless someone is sent? And Lord, we know that we should not go into evangelism of any type until we prayed it through. I remember when I was a, a pastor in the city of uh, Yellowknife, and we were watching a series of, of videos on evangelism. And constantly through that series, the, uh, the presenter said, listen, you can do any type of evangelism you want. The secret of success is prayer. I remember, Lord, we then spent the next year in prayer. I remember that. Every Wednesday night, I had canceled the Bible studies. And I said, we're just going to have a year of prayer. And that's what we did. We spent the entire year in prayer. And then we sent for an evangelist whose name was Max Sobrak. And Max came up there. And in three days we saw 65 people come to know the Lord. Now, our church went from 185 on a Sunday morning to 206, or, um, uh, 
to 250. And then after that, it grew to almost 300 people on a Sunday morning. How did that happen? It happened because we prayed. And Father, that's what we're doing today. We're not going to let go of the horns of the altar. We're going to pray for our unsaved loved ones. We're going to pray for the backsliders. We're going to pray right now, Lord, for the unsaved. Because we know that, Lord, there is so little time. And we want them to be saved. We want them, Lord, to have a relationship with you. It is so important that we expound in prayer, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Again, coming back to our original scripture from the book of Proverbs, he who wins souls is wise. We want to be wise, Lord. We want to be able, Lord, to reach those in our world. We don't want anyone to go to a lost eternity. We're not that cruel. We don't want anyone to go to hell. We want them to have eternal and abundant life. And that's why we're here today in prayer. And that's why we pray. Because, Lord, there is a battle between good and evil. There's a battle between the enemy and us. And we are going to win when we exercise the wonderful uh, avenue of prayer, that communion with God. Lord, prayer is not just building ourselves up. Prayer is much greater than that. And it has to do with reaching into the spiritual realm and bringing back people from the brink in that spiritual realm. And that's why we're here today. So, Father, thank you today for the time that we have spent together. Thank you, Lord, for the fact that, Lord, we have the privilege of being able to pray and, Lord, to exercise that to its full capacity. Help us to do that, Lord, today. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, my name is Robert Dean Steele. I hope that you've enjoyed our prayer time. Of course, it is not just prayer, but it's also a teaching session. If you like what you've been hearing or seeing, please press the like button and subscribe to my YouTube channel. My name is Robert Dean Steele. You have yourself a great and godly day.